resources and information, increase dialogue, and provide mutual support for the diverse group of night sky advocates that live throughout the West. Um, our three pillars are connection, communication, and collaboration. It's kind of a tongue twister, so I dare you to say that five times fast. Uh, it's presented by the NAR Initiative and the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative. So we kind of partnered together to make this happen. I'm so grateful for NAR. Um, if you're not familiar with NAR, it's an acronym. It stands for Gateway Natural Amenity Region Initiative. It acts as a regional hub for research, education, and outreach regarding gateway communities specifically, but anyone's welcome to learn from this fantastic resource. Uh, the initiative is housed with the Utah State University Extensions Institute of Outdoor Recreation and Tourism. So as coordinator for the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative, I work with communities, with park service folks, with public land managers, anyone that lives throughout the Colorado Plateau. Our initiative is all about protecting dark skies. It's a voluntary initiative. And we do have a sister dark sky cooperative called the Basin and Range, which is just to the west. So Liz is going to pay some more information about NAR and both dark sky cooperatives if you want to visit those sites. So today's webinar, we're joined by a panel of four incredible astrophotographers. I'm so excited for you to meet them and learn from them. Um, today, it, the session's more about uh, the why behind astrophotography and less so about the how. And what we'll do is each uh, panelist was, is going to take about 15 minutes to tell their story. And then we will segue into a Q&A. And to kick things off, uh, Ryan Andresen is going to share his story. Welcome, Ryan. Hey, thank you so much, Aubrey. And uh, yeah, let's see, Liz, if you can put me full screen. Okay. Okay, you guys see me at full screen? Let's transition here to my slides. Are you able to see the slides at full screen? I'm just so sorry, I, I'm only seeing, I'm not seeing that uh, it is going to full, uh, to a full screen. Yep, you're good, Ryan. Okay, sorry. Um, all right. So again, my name is Ryan Andresen, and I formed basically it's a Facebook page, an Instagram page uh, called Night Sky Science. Um, I, I will kind of go into the history of how that formed a little bit later, uh, but let's start off with just how I started uh, into this. Um, believe it or not, I wasn't really a photographer, or you know, I had a little Canon. Uh, I think a 20D back in the day. I thought that was pretty cool. And until I uh, quickly uh, discovered that that wasn't going to be enough to do this kind of stuff. So how did I get here? So um, on the left here, uh, I'm going to point because it's totally backwards to what I can kind of see, um, is my house. And uh, I moved up there about five years ago. So we're in the uh, uh, eastern part of Layton. And they were installing some street lights, and all of a sudden, I came home from work, and and oh, that you know they were putting this thing into the ground. I didn't think anything of it until they turned it on a couple of weeks later when they connected the power to it, and my bedroom just turned into just daylight. And I and I I didn't have a lot of very, I guess blackout-ish curtains in my my bedroom at the time, and and it was just a nightmare to uh, to sleep and whatnot. Uh, and then it just kind of transitioned to there. Here I am on the right. This is what it, I, I look like today. Um, I have a few telescopes, um, uh, I think four cameras now, and uh, the, that are always with me um, everywhere I go. The telescopes, not so much, but a lot of times when I travel, I travel for a living, and those cam at least two of them are going to be with me at all times because I just have fallen in love with the night sky. Um, so what I had to do is, you know, uh, going back on, uh, let's go back on that light, that street light. You know, I went down to the city and they weren't really too helpful on mitigating that light from my backyard. And I think the answer that really kind of sparked it was, I had a city council member tell me, hey, is there any chance you can just put a blanket in your window? And uh, it, it, it really, that I just, I, I saw that disconnect. And so um, I Googled it. I got, I, I 
uh, what can I do? And uh, I found this place called the International Dark Sky Association and made a phone call. And I don't recall who I spoke to. It could have been uh, Dr. Barantino. I couldn't read, but it was so helpful and, and said, hey, Antelope Island, the state park just became a dark sky park. Contact Wendy Wilson out there. She's the assistant manager. Maybe she can help you out. Because uh, I know that she's been out there uh, talking about the dark skies. And, and so I did. And she uh, was so willing to help out. So. Uh, she invited me out for a couple events and and I thought, well, you know, I've got to do something to get the message out about light pollution. I will help you out and see what we can do. So I had to get the message out. So I formed a Facebook page called Dark Sky Layton. That was the town that I, I live in and and thought, well, you know, let's just see what happens and started getting uh, a lot of folks that were talking about it in the community. Oh, yeah, my light's pretty bright, too, in, in the local community. Um, so I, I, what I called it, I declared a uh, war on all the cities. So, uh, basically we're looking at Antelope Island State Park. It's in the middle of the Great Salt Lake and we're facing east towards what we call the Wasatch Front here. And these are the cities that are, uh, where those, what we call now light domes. And I think everybody in here or, or most folks in here kind of understand how that all works. And we decided, well, hey, what we need to do is go into these cities and find out if we can speak to all these, these folks, and particularly the, the management, the, the city councils and all that good stuff. So Wendy and I, uh, that's what we made this mission. So I came out with us, you know, I said, look, we got to get on social media. I wasn't in there. I was, wasn't on Facebook, wasn't on Instagram. And, but I knew this was really gonna be the effective way to get through to everybody cheaply, instead of going out buying flyers and going door to door, because that's what I originally started with, with my neighborhood about this. And then I had to become a photographer. And uh, yes, I took this photo, I was out on Antelope Island and we're just kind of watching some bison. And, uh, and uh, oh, I saw this gal get just, I, I'm shooting with a telephoto lens and and just couldn't believe what I was seeing. But yeah, so I had to become a photographer to get that social media out. Uh, so I, what captured me was right here. And one of the uh, other panelists, uh, uh, Benamaya Foot. Uh, this is where we met. This was a uh, Astrophotography 101 that was put on by Duke Johnson from the Clark Planetarium down in Salt Lake City. And uh, uh, Wendy invited me out not to learn about astrophotography, but to document that how many people show up at these events. Because I think these events are actually uh, one of the biggest events that they do put on. And it's the most popular. And there we are, uh, you know, a bit of my eyes on the side. And I think her, she was trying to do the same thing for the IDA. Um, so j just, I did shoot some video out there. There's no really sound to it, but this is, was us that were out there. And what was amazing was, is all these folks getting ready. I could see them shooting the great sunset that was out there. And again, I wasn't really into photography much, just capturing this moment. And uh, what uh, part of it, I think later on in here we'll have, I had, I had an infrared camera that I was able to take a picture of some photos as they were out there. And the oohs and the ahs were blowing me away at, at, as they were connecting to the to the sky. I, it, it touched me and it touched me in a way that I just, I couldn't really quite get, but it was great to see this, all these folks. I, what I, I'll later I'll tell you that it's kind of my, my term is they're touching it for the first time. And I think it's a, a big deal. So, out I went. I took kind of, I, I listened to the um, the talk kind of half-heartedly because I was shooting the folks interacting and thought, well, I'm going to go try. And, and I think every photographer's first experience in touching the night sky, they'll remember it. And here's mine. This is my, ah, I touched a park. I went down the road after this class and parked my Jeep and thought, well, I'll, let me just see what I can get. And not the greatest, but it's the greatest for me. And it's something that touches me, that, that probably will always stay with me. I'm, I'm connected with it. And that's the part that I needed to, to, 
spread the word and, and get people to touch it as well. So here we are. Um, I teamed up again with Antelope Island State Park. We went and hit these cities. They had these farmers markets. So I went and we bought a, a tent and some tables. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, let me see if I can put my cursor. This little telescope here, and I can't remember whatever happened to it. I think I resold it, but I bought it off of classifieds as a prop. And what was so funny is people were asking, hey, can we take a look at that telescope? And huh, sure. I, and the moon was out during the day and I hardly knew how to run this stupid thing, but people were lining up and Wendy was just giggling because she knows how this works. This, people just gravitate to the sky. And so I needed a better scope. I needed one that tracked. And here we go. I bought uh, a, a Celestron eight inch. And here I am. I've infiltrated Layton City's uh, planning commission. They were talking about uh, how to do a general building plan of the city and they invited the public out and I put this telescope out uh, in the entrance and with my little sign and I didn't get a picture of all the folks that came out of it that lined up but I could tell that they were kind of uh, almost like irritated that I had taken the tension away from them in order to look up but all I really it was a way for me to get the folks to talk about uh, the light that they had been putting up uh, excuse me. Uh, so I'm going to call it the expensive mistake. <laughs> this telescope, let me go back here. <laughs> I made the mistake of going down to the Clark Planetarium and talking to one of the individuals of the telescopes. And he says, well, hey, you can put your camera on it and buy this uh, $10, what they call T-ring and shoot the picture and see what you can get out of it. So I, of course, pointed up to the Orion Nebula that was just barely kind of coming up that, that morning. And that was my first deep sky uh, uh, photograph. And it blew me away. I could not believe what I was seeing because if you've ever looked at the Orion Nebula with your eyes, you really can only see black and white. And so it's fuzzy, it's cool. But when your camera can see it with those just cool sensors, uh, wow, it just starts coming out. The color comes out. And yeah, uh, several thousand after this, and and uh, I'm I'm out. You know, I was hooked. So uh, I asked. There was a comet, Comet 46P. I don't know if you ever heard about. It. They called it the Christmas Comet. It was a couple of years ago. And I asked Wendy, Hey, do you mind if I do a class on it? I would. I was shooting it, and and she goes, Yeah, sure. I'll put it out there. And we filled this, this room to capacity. I think the capacity was only maybe about 35. And so Wendy said, hey, we, we can only have so many people in this room. And people were just ecstatic to see this little comet that I couldn't really, you couldn't see it other than into the telescope. And it was just this little fuzzy dot, but they were interested. And that was cool. And then I think the biggest moment of all that caught attention, the attention of, uh, city council members and i remember the commissioners came out from the county we did zoom the moon there was a lunar eclipse and i said hey let's do this event we'll call it zoom the moon i'll bring my telescope and i'll bring a little projector i can put my camera on it we'll project it up onto the side and maybe we could have a uh, charity do a class inside and maybe we'll get 50 or so folks in uh, i remember as i was setting up the telescope the radio, uh, Wendy's radio goes off and the radio says, hey, we have a lineup of cars that Syracuse City is kind of getting upset that we're blocking traffic. And we looked up and the whole, you can look up over the causeway that comes out to the great, uh, to the island on, along the Great Salt Lake and it was lined with cars. And we had over three, 400 people show up. Charity had to do four, I think three or four classes about that, but it was incredible. We couldn't believe just a lunar eclipse that, that people could just see on their own, but they wanted to gather in this area and, and see it with a telescope and see it with other things. And so we, that was just the hit. And, and still to this day, we still get people that, that ask us, hey, when's the next event? Um, so, I think what I like to talk about is a touch, helping others touch the sky, whether it be with a camera, a telescope. Um, and here, let me play this. This is just uh, a, a star party event at Antelope Island State Park that the Ogden Astronomical Society brings out. But it just, it, it brings so many people out. And I remember that night, 
uh, I watched a gal come off of that ladder and she had tears and they're looking at Saturn and they're looking at the rings. And she says, I've never seen that before. And I, that, that teariness is, is so, it's such a cool thing to, to encounter. And I think that's what I like about, uh, teaching astrophotography, uh, astrophotography classes, especially, particularly the, the first timers is because it's that first touch is the big deal. Uh, so where I am today, and it's, uh, I, I fly for a living. And so uh, I cruise around a lot at night and I get to see just scenes like this. Um, unfortunately, you see a lot of light nodes, particularly in the Eastern United States, but per, uh, coming out West, seeing vast amounts of ground um, that is untouched by light pollution is just incredible. And then of course, you know, you get access to the sky at 40,000 feet over those areas. It's just incredible. Um, so, and then here's just some scopes this is at Antelope Island. You'll see sometimes we'll see me out there working um, and capturing both what we, what I call wide field from a regular camera and then deep sky where I have actually a, a dedicated astronomy camera attached to the back of that telescope as it tracks through. So a couple of my favorite places I like to go, uh, my, that Colorado Plateau is just amazing. On the left is uh, Goblin Valley, oh, just so dark there. I did use some artificial lighting. Now, some parks don't allow artificial lighting, and so I'm trying to do my best not to use the artificial lighting, um, which is on the right in Canyon as there's the arches, uh, arches, uh, or I'm sorry, not arches, but uh, uh, Canyonlands National Park and the Mesa Arch there. And that was just a few, probably about a month ago where we captured it coming up um, early, early in the morning and drove all the way out there for one night and then drove all the way back into Salt Lake. It's about a four and a half hour drive uh, each way. A uh, deep sky has really grabbed me as well. Um, just to putting that uh, camera on the telescope is incredible. Now these typically each image uh, requires uh, almost four to five hours to shoot. Um, because what you're doing is you're capturing this dim, dim light and, and capturing sequences and then allowing the computer to what we call stack those images together. So on the upper left up here is the Ro Ufuji with complex, which is one of my favorite things to shoot. That's kind of a summertime. It's near the core of the Milky Way in the, in the area of uh, Scorpius. Um, beautiful colors, the blues, which is a lot of oxygen that they call emission nebula. And then on the left is uh, the, the more orange, which is sulfur. And then you got the red hydrogen that emits. And then also there's a star cluster right in there, just so much going on. And then of course, uh, those of you that know the Orion uh, uh, Nebula, where next to it is the, uh, the Running Man Nebula. Um, probably most photographers are, that start going into deep sky will start with that object. It's big, it's bright, it's great. I mean, it's just fabulous once you touch it. And again, that was my that was my touching of the of the deep sky. Uh, and then just a little bit over from the Orion Nebula, if you shift left into the Orion's Belt, there's a horse head and flame nebula. A lot of stuff going in there. There's hydrogen and sulfur, and again, oxygen that's being illuminated by that big bright star just to the left of the uh, the horse head. Uh, so what, it's just so amazing. And I'm not, you know, I took an astronomy class in college and I probably slept through half of it, I hate to admit, but, uh, I wish I had paid it more attention because now I can touch it and I can see it and, and it's just, it brings so much meaning uh, to the night sky. So the current projects that I have going on, so I love to volunteer for these things. I think it's important that we do protect the night sky and, and, and if I can, uh, you know, spread the word by showing people these images, that's, that's my mission. And so working on the Southeastern Night Sky Reserve here, um, it's a long-term goal. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, it's it's a very complex system uh, or, or process because you have a lot of folks that just, you know, it's, it's hard to understand that, you know, you want to shield the light and they think you want to turn off lights. And so, but we're, the, I think the work is, is moving in, in the right direction. Uh, the state parks has been awesome. They have, uh, I think, certified six or seven state parks in the last year, which was just awesome for, for parks because Utah has the most and, and they're so so good about it and they have such great programs. And then I'm also a member of my local chapter of the IDA and, and uh, just earlier today we were helping out Tracy Aviary uh, Nature Center and just having a booth there and talking about you know shielding your lights and how they affect, affect wildlife. Um, also you know because I carry a bunch of cameras around I've been uh, 
uh, privilege to be able to tote around the University of Ohio's uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Brian Bollinger's. Uh, he's doing a, a study on uh, light domes and trying to develop a way to do this. So he's had a has a modified uh, cannon that I take out of with my other cameras that I take a, a fisheye shot of the night sky. And what we're looking at is Antelope Island here with Salt Lake and then up to the north is the Ogden area of the light pollution and everything west is, is pretty much, uh, you know, the desert of, of, of Nevada and whatnot. So uh, really, really great skies if you want to look at Antelope Island and look to the west and then just some uh, other stuff. A lot of this I don't quite understand, but um, on how these levels are, but it, it mean, it just is so interesting to see all this stuff. So last thing I have is, uh, this is my quote. If I think if you touch it, you're gonna wanna protect it. And that's just, I, I truly believe that that is, is how we need to uh, persuade folks into protecting it. You need to touch it yourself. I can't, I can show you beautiful pictures, but it's not until you do it yourself um, that it's really gonna uh, have meaning. So uh, I thank you so much. Uh, that was my presentation. And if we have any questions, I'd be happy to ask, or are we gonna go uh, until the very end, Aubrey? Thanks, Ryan. I think the plan is to go to the very end, uh, but what a beautiful presentation. Uh, again, I want to remind our audience today, I, I see there's a lot of astrophotographers in the audience. Today, our discussion is more about the why behind taking this beautiful imagery and how we can use that as a tool to communicate the importance of protecting the night sky. However, we are going to post information about these talented photographers in the chat so you can visit their sites, get in touch, learn more about their techniques and strategies. Uh, so I'm going to post Ryan's website in the chat and I wanted to vocalize a question we do have for our audience today. If you wouldn't mind submitting your answers in the chat, we'd like to know where you're joining us from and what your interest in astrophotography is, if you're willing to share that with us today. Uh, so I'll grab Ryan's website information and we're going to have Betty Maya Foot go next. Hello. <laughs> Should I just go ahead and, and start? Okie dokie. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, it's good to see everyone. My name is Betty Maya Foote, and I am the Director of Engagement for the International Dark Sky Association. Um, I've been an astrophotographer ever since I started working at Utah State Parks. And we actually needed to take photos of the night sky to include in our dark sky place applications. And when I took my first photo of the Milky Way with the Canon Rebel uh, and the state parks camera, um, I didn't really believe it was possible. And then when it kind of came up on the back of my camera screen, uh, it really changed my life. It is possible. It does look like that. It's not fake. Um, and those realizations to me just kind of kept me and pushed me along in the um, quest to continue on the journey of astrophotography. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you guys about darkness, but also about the power of light and how I've really come to understand the power of light and I've come to understand the power of light through my work as an astrophotographer. Um, and I just like to start with this screen of darkness because I, at the beginning of my presentations, just wanna challenge everybody to think about what our current perception of darkness is. Um, for a lot of us, we're scared of the dark. Uh, we think of it as bad. We think of it as um, scary and, you know, we want to be the light in the dark, right? But um, I will challenge us today to maybe shift that perception a little bit and see if we can think of darkness a little differently. And um, to me, what I've learned is that in darkness, there is so much light and it takes this darkness to really see and understand the power of light. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk to us about, talk to you about today. Um, and I'll start here. 
with what our eye sees. So when we're kind of out at night, when we're at a dark sky place, this to me is kind of what the experience feels like. We don't see color at night because our eyes utilize rod cells, which only can perceive light and dark, and they don't use our cone cells, which we use during the day, which actually perceive color. So at night, we're really, our, because of the, our human eye limitations, we're seeing in black and white, uh, but we are able to see like the beautiful dark bands of the Milky Way. We're able to see beautiful bright stars and we're able to kind of make out uh, the foreground in front of us. Um, but if we could pause our eyes and open the exposure for 20 or 30 seconds and let that light amass in our brains, um, we would see a lot different of a picture. And that's the type of image we can see with a camera. So this is the light that exists in the environment that we can't see with our own human eyes, but that scientific instruments like cameras can pick up and can observe. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about how photography can be used to really illustrate the power and impact of lighting on our environment um, and how I've learned about the power of light through astrophotography. So if we think back on those other images, right? That first one, the kind of starlight that we see with our own eyes and how we feel like that's pretty faint light, right? Like that light, it's not very bright. That's just like there's stars, but that's like, you know, we barely notice them a lot of the time. Um, and then when you think about how that camera picks up that light, we can really start to understand the power of it. Um, and then when I look at this photo, it, you know, it really makes you think like the power of the light that we are adding to our everyday environment is so much more than we can even perceive with our own human eye. Um, and our street lights and our city lights and our residential lighting are really impacting our environment on a huge scale in a way that we may not be cognizant of. Um, but that the power of photography can really help to reveal. So I'm just gonna kind of go through some of the images I've been exposed to in my work as a dark sky advocate over the years that speak to me about the power of light and how it impacts our environment. Uh, to start off, this image comes to us from the Capture the Dark photo contest that we held last year, which will be held again in June. So keep your eye out for that. But we had a category that was illustrating the impact of light pollution. And this image really spoke to me um, because we're all familiar with this, right? Like when we leave our porch light on, we can see the moths and the insects circling around that light at night. Um, and I'll share, I learned why moths actually circle around a light. Um, it's because they utilize the night sky, the moon and other bright celestial objects to keep them on a straight path as they fly. So in order to orient and direct themselves, moths will keep the moon on one side of their field of vision so that as they travel, they know that they can, are going in a straight line. Um, and that works for them because there's no way that they can actually reach that moon, right? There's no way they can actually reach those stars. It always stays far away and above them. Uh, but with the addition of human caused artificial light at night, these moths are actually able to reach their, uh, their moon or their star, right? Which they think that's what it is. And so when they're flying around in circles around your porch light, they actually think they're going in a straight line and they think they're orienting themselves in a straight line. Um, and that to me was just really sad and something that I, you know, gave me the feels for moths, which I didn't really think was possible. Uh, but our light is incredibly powerful and impacts so many more species than just us. Uh, but this image taken during the uh, cicada biblical plague of Las Vegas, which happened a few years ago, shows us that our own lighting choices can make a difference and can help out the environment and the cre other creatures around us. Um, so we can see here that the cicadas are flocking to this bright blue white light, whereas they're pretty much ignoring this like warmer shielded um, dark sky friendly light. And I really like this image because it shows very, um, 
precisely that our own lighting choices have a huge impact on all of the living beings around us and that we can make good choices in order to lessen the harmful impacts of artificial light at night. Um, and if we don't see images like this, it's kind of easy to ignore, right? It's kind of easy to just live in our own bubbles and to live in our own worlds. Uh, but photography really shows us and kind of makes us confront the fact that our actions affect more than just us. Um, and this image of the most light polluted spot in the world of the Luxor in Las Vegas, uh, taken by Babak Tafreshi, really shows you that these animals and other creatures are incredibly impacted by our practices and that our own egotistical want to market and to create and to be seen impacts a lot more than just us. And when we're confronted by this through photography, we can really see what we're doing and change our practices for the better. This is another example, I think, of how photography can be used to help illustrate the impacts of artificial light at night. Uh, when I first saw these images, I was blown away. Uh, these are, this is an annual art exhibit from the Fatal Light Awareness Program, which is a group in Toronto, Canada that monitors buildings at night for fatal bird collisions. So just as moths and other uh, beings utilize the night sky to navigate, so do birds. And when they're confronted by brightly lit cities, they are number one, confused because they can't see the stars that they used to navigate. And secondly, they're attracted to this light. And so they will fly, if not directly into a building and collide and usually die, um, they'll be stuck in this light. They basically are attracted to it and they are reluctant to leave that lit area. So if they don't initially collide with the building and die, they will stay around the brightly lit area until they fall to the ground from exhaustion where they're usually predated on by cats or other city predators. And so this is one year of birds collected in Toronto. And I don't think it's even the full sample of birds that were collected there. This is 2,100 bird bodies that were collected by volunteers that were impacted a building and fell to the ground. Um, and you can say that and you can talk about how many birds die each year, but when you see a photo like this, uh, to me, it's much more impactful than just seeing the numbers or talking about it. Uh, and this one really pulls at my heartstrings. This also comes to us through our Capture the Dark photo contest. This is one of our finalists for the impact of light pollution category. Um, and we can see this is an endangered seabird um, in New Zealand. And it is, has been seeking out the one and only little respite from the light. And you can see it's sleeping right here, trying to find a spot to sleep in the shadow of these bright, overwhelming 4,000 Kelvin lights. Um, and I just think this type of image is incredibly poignant uh, to see this one lonely bird seeking out the darkness in this sea of artificial light. To me, tells the story so much more than just saying birds are impacted by light pollution. But when you see this lonely, sweet little guy trying to find the one spot of darkness, uh, breaks my heart, makes me want to cry. And I was astounded when I first saw these images because it's easy to understand that like light can impact animals. Um, but you don't really think trees are that smart, right? Like we know they're smart, but like, Trees are also impacted by this. So many plants are impacted by artificial light at night. And here we can see exactly how that happens. The spread of light has changed that the way these trees understand day length. So when that light is on at night, these trees are thinking, oh, these are longer days. So they don't change seasonally. So instead of losing the leaves like they need to, they think it's still fall instead of winter and the area of that tree that's getting the light has kept those leaves. Also the same thing here on the other side, instead of losing the chlorophyll and changing color because it's fall, the area that's lit under this street lamp still thinks it's summer and has all the full chlorophyll in those leaves. 
Um, and these images, like when I first saw them, I, I was astounded. And um, also just in general, trees that live under artificial light have shorter lifespans in general. Um, so I think photography can really be used as a tool to help illustrate that light is impactful on almost every single aspect of our environment. Uh, this is another image that when I saw it, I was just blown away. Uh, this is a soybean field. And you can see how the street lights that are lighting up these streets, the cone of light that actually touches those soybean plants has incredibly and drastically changed the life cycle of those plants versus the rest of the plants that are not touched by that artificial light. Um, and to me, you can say a thousand times, light impacts plants, but until you see this type of image and how this really is so illustrative of the power of light on the environment around us, uh, photography can really be an incredible tool in communicating these important issues. Uh, photography also can be used to illustrate how our lighting practices can change for the better and really help us see more in the night sky and can also help photographers capture more in the night sky. So these come to us from Jeff Dai in Beijing, who runs the IDA chapter there, who's also one of my idol astrophotographers, is a main contributor to the world at night. Um, and is just an incredible photographer in general. Definitely check him out if you haven't heard of him before. Uh, but this is a village around Beijing um, before they changed their lighting practices. And this is what he was able to capture in the night sky. Uh, and then this is after they changed their lighting practices, turned a lot of the lights off that weren't necessary, shielded a lot of the lights. You can see that there's still light on the ground visible for the people on the ground to go around and do what they need to do in their village, but that the, the night sky is just so much more visible and um, stunning and available to these people in the village than it was before when they had uh, less dark sky friendly lighting practices. So another way that photography really illustrates how we can make a big change for the better. Um, and I love this image that came to us recently from Astro Backyard, um, which shows the Bortle scale, which is a scale that we astronomers and astrophotographers use to kind of classify how dark our sky is. And it shows the different, this is the same constellation, Orion, in all of these different categories of Bortle scale. And so photography, this to me is a tool that directly shows what light pollution is doing and how it directly impacts our view of the night sky as humans and as photographers. Um, and for me, I would just rather, I would rather the light in my sky come from the stars and the air glow and the beauty of the world than be washed out by a gray haze. Um, and I think this image does a really good job of kind of illustrating how our lighting practices impact our own view of the night sky. And photography can show us how we can be a better neighbor. Uh, this comes to us from Richard O'Brien in Colorado in Boulder. Um, imagine being this neighbor, right? I'm in my house. <laughs> this is my view out my window. And this image on the left, right, there's two glaring lights that are just shining directly into my window. Like that sucks. But simple changes like shielding those two bright glaring lights in, have immediately and drastically changed my quality of life as this person's neighbor. Um, probably made me a lot better of a neighbor and you a lot better of a neighbor. And photography really shows how much of a difference this can make. And it really helps us to communicate the need to have uh, community friendly and neighbor friendly lighting practices. I think photography is also a really important way that we can illustrate the value of dark sky friendly lighting as increasing safety. One of the main, um, I guess, pushbacks that we get as dark sky advocates is like, what about safety, right? I wanna feel safe at night. I don't wanna get robbed. I wanna be feel comfortable in the dark. And I'm 100% cool with that. I'm actually like kind of scared of the dark myself. 
And I'm not just trying to tell everyone to turn all your lights off all the time. But what I am saying is that dark sky friendly lighting practices help reduce glare, increase our visibility in the darkness and can show us what is actually lurking in those shadows. So in the above image, we see nothing in the gate, right? You can't see that there's a person there. But when we shield that light to the camera, we're able to see that there actually was a person there the whole time. We just couldn't see him because of that light basically coming directly into our eye it makes it impossible for us to see at night. Um, and I can talk till I'm blue in the face about how <laughs> dark sky friendly lighting increases safety, but until you actually see the effects of it like this in a photo, you're not gonna believe me. Uh, and that brings me to our next point of adding artificial light at night to images, uh, Ryan. But <laughs> no, uh, this, in, this time lapse I took last summer at Delicate Arch in Arches National Park. And I, um, I was amazed at how much artificial light people were using to shine up the arch. It's actually against the rules to light paint in arches and canyon lands. And a lot of the um, parks around southeastern Utah. Um, because to me, this it really impacted my own experience and personal enjoyment of being there under a dark night sky. Um, it didn't feel dark. <laughs> didn't feel like I was in a dark area. There were lights everywhere shining in my face, shining in my camera, shining up on the arch. You know, it, um, I just bring, leave this here to challenge everyone to think about how your own lighting practices, if you're in an area where there's a lot of other people or astrophotographers or even wildlife, Think about how your own lighting is impacting others' experience of the darkness around you. Um, it's, you know, if you need to use your headlamp to hike over to the arch, that's okay, that's great. If you need a light to be safe and to do what you need to do to navigate in the darkness, go for it. But I think that in cases like this, where there are a lot of other people around, it's a beautiful natural area, people are there to experience darkness, it's best practice to not use artificial light at night to, to light up your subject. So what can you do? Uh, you can use a lot of other, other natural sources of light to illuminate your foreground. Uh, this is one of my favorite images I've ever taken um, and everybody thinks it's a sunrise, uh, but this is actually moonrise at Warner Lake in uh, the LaSalle Mountains of Moab, Utah. And it's just to me, moonlight is an incredible, beautiful, natural source of light that we can all utilize to naturally illuminate our foreground uh, without using a big torch or light to impact others' experience around us. Uh, here's another image uh, taken with 82% moonlight and you can clearly see the Milky Way still. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are hanging out above the mountains and there's also a fun little deer friend who visited me in my time lapse. This is a single exposure. Um, but th that is to say that I, when I started astrophotography, I hid from the moon. I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, oh, moon's up. I don't need to shoot, you know, uh, you know, new moon only, dark skies only. But when I started utilizing natural light to illuminate my foreground, I got so many more better photos. And um, like, also you can't shine your flashlight at these mountains and light this up like this. Like this type of lighting you can only get from natural sources in the environment. Um, here is an image, uh, a time-lapse that I took down Desolation Canyon of the moonrise. And I just think that natural lighting adds so much beauty to these time lapses and you can still see the Milky Way in the sky. Um, and just capturing how the light changes naturally is uh, such a beautiful thing. Another way that you can capture foreground illumination without using artificial light is by taking advantage of blue hour. 
which is when the sun is four to six degrees below the horizon. So it hasn't completely sunk yet. And it's not true dark, but it's not up and it's not sunset. And there's still enough light in the sky that that blue light is refracting through our atmosphere. So we get these beautiful blue skies but the Milky Way shines through and there's enough light that it gently illuminates your foreground. And this is my favorite time to take photos during the night. Uh, just another example, like these canyons are so huge and vast that even if I tried to light them up with a flashlight, I couldn't. Um, but just utilizing the light of the setting sun is a, is a way that I can capture the vastness of this desert landscape against a, a beautiful night sky in a single exposure. And I'm just going to end here with a kind of a success story about how some of our volunteers around the world have used art of, have used uh, photography to help raise awareness and build support for dark sky conservation. Uh, so this image here was taken by Joyce Harmon in Rappahannock, Virginia, and she actually got a grant from her local Community Arts Foundation to go photograph people's homes against the night sky. And then she was able to print these images out and give these homeowners prints of the beautiful night sky behind their home. And you can imagine if you see these types of images, um, you're gonna feel connected. You're gonna have that touch point, right, Ryan? And you're gonna wanna connect and preserve this night sky because it's, it is an incredible asset that we have and photography shows us this asset and it helps people feel more connected to it. Um, and so that is how we can use photography to really promote dark sky conservation, to understand the power of light um, and to hopefully help others understand the power of light as well. So. I, that, this is my email, bettymaya at darksky.org. Um, my Instagram is bettymaya.foot. If you want to uh, see more pretty dark sky images. Um, and my mouse just disappeared, but I will try to stop sharing now. So thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Betty Maya. Thank you for reminding us that being a good neighbor is not just about our human neighbors too. We think about plant life, insects. Um, fascinating and some of those images are really powerful and like you said give you the fills <laughs> um, so yeah astrophotography photography in general can be such a powerful tool for communicating a message I did share Betty Maya's website and a guide she created astrophotography 101 in the chat if you'd like to check those out we are going to be bumping up against 3 p.m pretty soon and if you have a hard stop at three, um, thank you so much for joining us today. We, we won't force you to stay, but if you would like to stay a little bit longer, we'll still have room for question and answer after three. Uh, we will be having another Western Night Sky sponsored webinar in June featuring the Illuminating Engineering Society. Registration information for that will come soon. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it to Brent and Don Davis, our final panelists. And then if you're willing to stay around for a couple of minutes, we'll do a little Q&A. A reminder, there is a Q&A feature in Zoom. You're welcome to submit questions that way, or you can use the chat feature. Uh, welcome, Brent and Dawn. Hopefully, we get over our, some of the technical difficulties we've been having behind the scenes. I think we're good. Uh, we're about to find out. Um, apologize, about five minutes before this uh, started, our internet connection went to dial-up speed. So uh, quick introductions of each other. I'll let Dawn go first. Hi there, I'm Dawn Davis, and um, I've uh, been doing astrophotography for about the last um, eight to 10 years or so, and it's really become a great passion. And back to Brent. And I've probably been doing photography for over four decades. Um, when I was, I really got started when I was in college, I actually worked for the, what, what at the time was the second largest newspaper in Washington state and did some art shows at the same time. And that was kind of how I made money while I was a college student. And I can say with certainty that that did absolutely nothing to change my social economic status as a starving college student, but it was good fun and learned quite a bit at the time. 
So we're going to talk a little bit here today. Our, our presentation might be a little bit different. It's, um, I'll say, a little more personalized. It's about what our journey has been and how we came to get interested in night photography and what we are doing with it, um, what some of our goals are. And if you get nothing else out of um, our little talk here, what we hope that you get out of it is to go out and have your own experience and experience the night sky, use night photography as a way of, of capturing your experiences and just enjoying the night sky. So um, we're gonna talk about how we got there um, the first couple of minutes, which I'll try and be pretty quick about. Um, literally don't have much of anything to do with night photography itself, but it'll explain how we got there. So we actually met about 40 years ago uh, when we were college kids working in Yellowstone National Park. We actually uh, worked for the concessionaire at the time, not the park service. So this is kind of going back to the old film days when we were um, doing a lot of outdoor stuff. Um, this is um, the other constant in our life as we were explaining to Aubrey the other day, we recognized early on what our limitations were. And so we stuck to raising dogs instead of kids. So um, these two little things were actually our, our respective wedding presents to each other. So that's been the other constant in our life. So we actually worked um, two mainstream, I'll say corporate America jobs that aren't terribly exciting, but when we weren't working, uh, we were always outside doing something. So early days, it was a lot of backpacking, um, a lot of cross country cycling, and probably it was about five or six years into our marriage before we took a trip where uh, the roof over our head was something other than our tent. Um, at some point, Don decided we needed to be scuba divers. Um, so we've been all over the Caribbean and Hawaii doing a lot of diving. Um, then we got into a bunch of sea kayaking. Built our own sea kayaks. Yeah, so that's a uh, mahogany kayak we actually made. And it turned out I had really good whale karma. So I was a good person to follow around with a camera if you wanted some good pictures. And if you look closely, there's, there's actually a, a little point and shoot disposable camera in my hand that actually has absolutely no pictures in it because I was so startled by this that I forgot to actually click the shutter even though I had a camera in my hand at the time. And shortly after that, uh, Don decided that we needed to become whitewater kayakers, which uh, honestly wasn't high on my list of things to do, but um, it's kind of an inauspicious beginning for myself. I ended up in the emergency room the first day, um, but eventually we became fairly competent class four whitewater kayakers and um, traveled the world to a number of different places. Um, this is in Ecuador, this little creek at some point flows into the Amazon. So when we've been out on all these trips, which we've been around a little bit, the camera was always with us and it was a great introduction tool, especially in the, in the wilderness where these little kids in the rainforest, man, if you took a camera out, they just, glommed onto you like white on rice. And um, obviously we couldn't give them prints, but they wanted to see their picture. So it was a lot of fun being a photographer in those settings. And there wasn't a lot of night photography involved with our kayaking days, because this is usually what happened at the end of the day as soon as you got off the river. Um, so we weren't really doing much whitewater photography or night photography at that point. Um, at some point though, age and injuries caught up with me and I had to quit uh, the whitewater kayaking and went back to my roots and started doing a lot of hiking and had a lot of extra time on my hands, retired shortly thereafter and started doing a lot of hiking and took some online photography courses, one of which was night photography. And kind of to Betty Maya's point, I was amazed at uh, what happens when you take pictures when the moon's out. I mean, it just, it's still conceptually, I understand, but you know, this picture was taken like at, at midnight in the Sierras with absolutely no artificial light. That's just the moon and, and the star trails. So I started doing a lot of night photography when I was uh, traveling around and Don was kind of looking over my shoulder and uh, decided that this was a pretty cool thing. So she started doing night photography. This is um, one of her photos. And this is um, a local photo that I'll let her talk about a little bit here. So um, I'm trying to be sensitive at the time I'm looking at it and realizing that we are um, 
getting close to the end and we haven't gotten kind of to the crux of it. But this photo does illustrate, um, I think a really key point in uh, night photography um, in, and just environmental etiquette in general. And that is to uh, be mindful of your environment uh, and to treat it with respect and also to be very aware of permissions and um, what's, what can be done and what can't be done um, legally as well as responsibly. This is a local bridge that's about 10 miles away from us. It's um, at an Army Corps of Engineers park. And it took about two years actually to get the permit to um, legally uh, be there at night to uh, take this photo. Um, and so my point is that it's always good, no matter where you are, to know what the regulations are, i.e., to Betty Maya's point, does your um, environment allow for light painting, yes or no? Um, does it allow for access after night, uh, yes or no? Some of the photos that we have that are going to be coming up are um, taken at um, Aztec Ruins National Monument and uh, Chaco Culture uh, National Historical Park. Both of those environments are closed to the public um, at night um, and really are only accessible if there's a special event or um, special permitting. So just, just be aware that, um, that that's a really important aspect of night photography. I think we're gonna go ahead and skip ahead uh, through an entire section here just to make sure that we can keep this on track. And uh, Brent's gonna talk a little bit about um, we're, sorry, we have a computer screen on the other side so we can see what we're uh, scrolling well, through. Well, I'm going to cover this really quick. So anyhow, this is, um, these are pictures that we just started doing on our own. So this is, this is what became our, our passion, our hobby after kayaking was a lot of night photography and um, travels. A lot of these are just in the Sierras here in California. And I apologize for buzzing through them so quickly. That wasn't our intent, but in the interest of time uh, not having this run real long, um, just kind of skimming over these. So eventually at, at some point, um, Don asked me or told me that my new job when I retired was to figure out what we were going to be doing when she fully retired. And so one of the things that I ended up doing was I got in contact with a, a woman by the name of Sarah Standard who was working for the National Park Service at the time in Glen Canyon, and she was advertising a volunteer position, um, which I applied for to help with their star parties and full moon tours. And it's like, oh man, I can do this. This is what I do anyhow. And it was just kind of one of those right place at the right time kind of things where um, Sarah at some point asked me if, if we'd be willing to do some night photography for them because it just so happened that at the time she was finalizing the IDA application for Rainbow Bridge to become an international dark sky park, um, which was a successful application. And um, Rainbow Bridge actually became the first dark sky sanctuary in North America at the time. So I just happened to be in the right place at the right time and uh, got to go to Rainbow Bridge at night, which again is one of those places that isn't really open to the public um, at, at night. Um, but I went there at the request of the Park Service both to take some photographs of Rainbow Bridge for their dark sky application, but also at Sarah's request um, to build a, a night sky video for Glen Canyon, which is um, still actually up on the MTS website, to advertise the dark sky program that they have at Glen Canyon. So this is a little time clip of, of Rainbow Bridge here that um, we did, which hopefully um, plays fairly well given our problems. So anyhow, we've had the good fortune of getting to be in one of the more amazing places in the world, a dark sky sanctuary and see how dark the sky is. So this is uh, one of the, we try not to do a lot of light painting anymore, but every once in a while we'll try it just to, in this case, get a different look for the park service in case they wanted a different look for whatever their purposes were. So this is another full moon photograph at Rainbow Bridge. And to Don's earlier point about permission, uh, Rainbow Bridge is a very special place and it's a, a sacred site to, I believe, at least six different native tribes there. Mm -hmm. And so one of the first things that I did, I, I'd been there during the day, but the first time I went there at night with a ranger was, we sat down and we talked about, okay, 
where do I, where do I not want to go? I don't want to take any photographs that somebody might see that would be disrespectful to this monument. And one of the big things that you're not supposed to do at Rainbow Bridge is ever walk under the bridge. Um, even though photographically you think, oh, that would be a, a really cool shot to actually stand directly underneath it. Um, that's just not something you do. So anyhow, this is was kind of a compromise we worked out where I went down in the, the river creek bed below, below the bridge and then walked several hundred yards away from it and got to look back at it. Um, so these are some other shots that I'll go through here quickly that we were able to do um, when we were at Glen Canyon. There's the full moon obviously rising over uh, Navajo Mountain and Horseshoe Bend, uh, been there both in the evening and in the morning. Uh, this is Navajo Bridge down by Lee's Ferry. And this, I put this in here just kind of as an example that sometimes when there's still cars going around, um, the headlights and taillights can actually add a little bit to the photograph. In this case, um, the yellow lights on the bridge is, is automobile traffic going back and forth across the bridge while I was taking this image. Uh, yeah, we're gonna skip this one in the interest of time. So this one, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this image. If you're shooting photographs and, and submitting them for contact contests, usually they're gonna be evaluated on some technical merit, you know, how you place the rule of thirds, line, color, texture, all that stuff. And, and the thing that I think really separates good photographs from great photographs is the emotional content and pulling the viewer into the photograph. And this is a photograph that honestly, I don't know that anybody else would actually want this up on their wall, but it has a tremendous emotional content um, for me in the sense that this was an opportunity where um, I went out uh, with a couple of rangers on a two day trip into a remote corner of um, Glen Canyon National Park and uh, really enjoyed my time with the other two rangers and uh, this particular individual here was, if you will, kind of the local ranger knew the area was kind of our guide and we became very good friends with her. And unfortunately, um, last year, shortly after she retired, um, she passed away. So this has um, a tremendous emotional impact for us. And the point of telling that little story is, again, make your own memories, go out there, have your own experiences and not necessarily worry too much about all the time what anybody else thinks about your particular images. If they mean something to you and the people that you're with, then, hey, you're on the right path. Can we do a timeout real quick? I, I don't know where our, our chat box is that we can, that we can get to Aubrey. Or Aubrey, just, can, Aubrey can, you, can you pop in real quick? Are we okay on time, Aubrey? You're fine. I, I encourage anyone who can stay and wants to, to do so. Um, otherwise, you're welcome to leave, but Brent and Don, you're welcome to continue. Thank okay. you. Okay, we All just right. wanted to make sure before we before we continued. We're trying to do the fast forward version <laughs> of, of this and it, so people don't have their day messed up. So I'm going to hand it back to Don. Hi, hi again. So um, we've we volunteered for um, several different places um, in kind of order of appearance. Uh, Glen Canyon that, that Brent uh, just went over and Rainbow Bridge is a subsect of uh, Glen Canyon. Technically it's its own park, but they're all under the same uh, park unit. And then we also worked for a dual park unit um, as Tech Ruins National Monument and Chaco Culture National Historical Park. And we've also done some uh, work for Oregon State Parks. So this uh, little section goes and talks about in order um, where we where we were with that. Uh, the image that you're seeing in front of you is uh, the internal uh, viewing uh, view of uh, the Great Kiva in Aztec Ruins National Monument. It's the only restored Kiva in the um, United States park system to my knowledge. And um, they restored it back to how it was they, they, how they think it was. And I could go on and on about this photo um, for a long time, but if you ever are in the Four Corners area near Farmington and you have an opportunity to stop in at Aztec Ruins National Monument, even if you just go to the Great Kiva and leave, do see it, it's, it's spectacular. 
This is the Great Kiva at night. Um, this is, we took this on the very first night that we got there. There obviously is a little bit of extra um, light that we put in uh, to the Kiva just so that we, we have little light pucks, just so we could see what it would have been like had there been someone in the Kiva at night creating light. This is uh, the morning. Um, in the morning, it's very beautiful. Um, and the sun shines through the, the Kiva windows. And I don't know if you can see me pointing my mouse, but it'll, um, it'll come in one side and then show on the other uh, side. This is a 360 degree view. Um, in full moon nights, the, depending on where you are in the Kiva, you will be able to see the full moon rising uh, through the Kiva windows. And it's usually best on the night after the full moon. This is also, not, we had the opportunity to be there for two uh, full moon cycles. And this is another uh, full moon over the Great Kiva. As you can see, it's a huge structure. And I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this is a very goodly section of the, of the ruins here. And then over here is an unexcavated ruin called the East Ruin. Uh, this required special permission. There's a very uh, large um, complex of uh, structures with um, rooms that interconnect and we've received um, permission to be able to go um, into these rooms at night and there's a really cool time lapse that goes with this but unfortunately it won't play um, but it is uh, viewable on our website at the Aztec Ruins um, videos. Uh, this is just another view of Aztec uh, looking north and a great cave is on either side of that uh, path that you see. Uh, moving on to Chaco, uh, Chaco has one of the oh, Chaco has the only um, uh, planetarium in the uh, U.S. park system that I'm aware of, and um, this was uh, on one of their astronomy nights in the astronomy festival where they had it open. You can see the telescope open through the little corner. Um, we do have a video that might work. That just kind of shows the excitement and enthusiasm of people coming in and seeing the um, seeing uh, things through the telescope. I believe uh, uh, that night everybody was looking at Saturn and uh, some of the other other nebulas, and then the moon was rising um, as the uh, as, uh, um, telescope was turning. Um, and this is a one of my favorite memories, hopefully it'll play. Um, this is Pueblo del Arroyo at Chaco. It was my personal favorite uh, ruin. It's um, unfortunately, you're getting the fuzzy version. It, it's finally clearing up, but this was just a beautiful, beautiful ruin. Um, and the Milky Way would go, come right through that window at night. There is a lot of great windows in there. Um, this is another, uh, I don't know whether this will come through or not, but this is Pueblo Benito, the largest of the ruins. And um, I would say this is not working. So you probably are gonna wanna check that out uh, through the website on a video. And this was what you would have seen there. This is one of the great kivas and, uh, the, and then the back wall here at Pueblo Benito facing north. And it's, a, I think this is Chetro Kettle the back section of that ruin. And uh, same again. Uh, this is Pueblo del Arroyo. Um, again, this was, uh, I used low level LED lighting uh, with, with this photo. And it was specifically done because this is a triwall kiva. It, it's, uh, I think the only triwall kiva in Chaco and I wanted, folks to be able to actually see the three walls. And again, part of the MPS was aware that I had lights. Um, so they are, uh, they, they do know about that. I, I didn't do anything funky with them. I, I sat down and made sure that I knew exactly where I could go and where I would be and all that before taking any, any images. Um, the moon rising over um, a wall and a still image of the Milky Way at Pueblo del Arroyo, um, same, it's, this is just a little bit to the right as the Milky Way moves to the right. This is a huge, huge ruin. This was probably one of my um, more interesting nights um, in that it sounded like a cow was getting murdered 
in the background, but really it was um, the elk rutting. <laughs> I had no idea. Um, and this is, this is, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. I'll, I'll, I know it, but I'll, I'll get back to you on it. Um, inside Pueblo Benito, uh, one of the last nights I shot there where the moon was coming up over the corner. And this is Casa Rinconada um, and a, a little star trail uh, time lapse here that shows the coming in, comings and goings of the, the uh, star trails. Uh, moving on to Oregon State Parks, I was absolutely blown away when I um, popped out the trailer the first uh, night to take a picture of the, um, right. sorry, yeah. Oregon State Parks, right? Yeah, yeah right. Prime, Prime Bill, yeah. Um, at Primeville Reservoir State Park, I, I popped out at 2 a.m. because I had uh, used my little um, app to find out where the um, where the Milky Way was going to be, and I knew that it was going to be over the sign, and I figured I'll get that uh, shot taken care of just in case we get bad weather, and of course we did get bad weather. We only got a few nights to actually shoot in Oregon that worked out, but oh my gosh, the Milky Way there was amazing. Um, and this is Cove Palisade State Park, a, a sister park unit. Um, to Prineville, not really sister, but they they do do uh, share some um, administrative things. So um, another favorite uh, favorite juniper tree. You can see there's a lot of moisture in the air, and this was probably my favorite shot from that time. Um, I had come to take a picture of the Milky Way around. 1 30, 2 o'clock in the morning, something like that. And I thought, oh, you know, if I wait another 20 minutes, I'll see whether or not, um, you know, I'll be able to watch the moon rise as well. And I didn't know whether I would be able to achieve getting the, um, the Milky Way and the moon together. And sure enough, I did. And it's right in the middle and it looked really pretty. So it was, it was very exciting. I got two nights of that um, in there. And this is a different view of the, um, the Cove Palisades. And, uh, little envy looking back over Prineville Reservoir. And oh, this is uh, just some favorites from each park that we would uh, talk about. So we each had some favorite memories of the parks. Uh, mine was being able to go to uh, Rainbow Bridge uh, National Monument. Um, turned out that it was actually on our anniversary that I got to go, best anniversary present ever, but with unfortunately without my husband. Um, and then uh, beautiful clouds over the Great Kiva in um, Aztec ruins. It was just a spectacular night, it has nothing to do with night photography, but boy, those clouds were great. Um, and Orion rising over one of the lesser kivas at um, Pueblo Benito and um, the full on view at Primeville of the moon rising in the Milky Way. And then we have Brent to talk about his things. Yeah, so I had a couple um, stories I was going to share. Um, this one isn't necessarily a, a happy story, um, but I'll try and tie it into the night photography. So this is obviously some some archaeological petro petroglyphs in Glen Canyon. Um, it's actually right below the dam itself. It's on the, the stretch between the dam and Lee's Ferry. And I, I went there at the request of Park Service kind of document this. And uh, honestly, it probably took me 15 or 20 minutes to get over the desecration of this site. It's a large panel. Um, people have done stuff like this where they're actually etching their initials on top of these ancient petroglyphs, which isn't something that can really be repaired. And it gave me an appreciation along with the rest of our experiences of what the Park Service in this case is actually doing. I mean, they're not only trying to protect the, the, the land itself, but they're trying to balance different types of user groups. They're taking care of the wildlife, the, the plant life, these archeological ruins. And they just, it, it brought home to me the complexity and the challenges that the Park Service has with their charter and what they're being asked to do. And one of those things that, that they do is advocate for, for night skies. So it, it really kind of motivated me personally to want to do everything I could um, while I was there as a volunteer to give them content, to get whatever message they want to get out to their constituents and promote their, their efforts. So nothing necessarily to do with night photography, but, um, and this is probably one of my most 
favorite stories of, of our volunteer time. Um, the, the short version is I was asked to come up here on top of this mesa, which is about 800 feet uh, above this ruin here in Chaco and to do some night photography. So I went up and, and set up as the sun was going down um, so I could do that. And as a volunteer, you usually have a radio with you. So if there's an emergency, you can call and request help. So I'm up there, um, the park's about to close and you, know, you can see the road in this image. And so I'm sitting up there watching the ranger go through um, the park in her car, kind of making sure all the visitors are out. And I'm sitting up there and then I, I hear on the radio call in, okay, I've, I've swept the park, um, everybody's out, I've closed the gate. I mean, she obviously knew I was there and what, what car I was driving, so she didn't um, make sure I had left the park. So, it, so she calls in that she's closed the park. And at that point, I'm sitting there as a volunteer and it hits me that I am the only person in this park right now. And, and what a privilege and rare opportunity is to see the park like that and basically have it to yourself. And about the amount of time it took me to have that thought, all these coyotes let loose and started howling. And it's probably the most coyotes I've ever heard in my life. It sounded like there were 20, at least 20 different coyotes howling and sounded like there were pups. And it was just the, the timing of it was that, you know, the ranger called to the park close. A few seconds later, these coyotes start howling. And you know the hair on my arms is going up, and it's like, oh my gosh, it's it's like these coyotes realize that they're gone, and you know, <laughs> and and we have to park back to ourselves. Woohoo! Let's let's go have fun, guys. So it was just kind of a magical moment um, to be able to experience that, and and at the same time of having that experience, actually being the the only person there in the park at that time. Um, this is actually we'll see if it plays uh, the time lapse that I shot. Um, that night while I was up there on that, oops, on that mesa. Um, so, it doesn't look yeah, like it's we're, we're still having some um, internet challenges here. So, we'll see if it settles. So, anyhow, before the sun goes down and then the stars, and, and then when the moon comes up, the, the ruins come back into view a little bit. So, anyhow, that was one of my favorite stories of really our, our time. Um, volunteering in the park service. So that would kind of be um, the end of our presentation such as it is. So hopefully the, the pictures kind of motivated you to get out and, and have your own experience. Um, we're never really trying to um, advertise ourselves. I apologize that a lot of the times these photos are saying buy photo in the bottom right. If you actually go to our website, we've actually don't sell any of these photos. Um, it, it's saying buy photo today because the only way it's letting me do this today is to be in the administrative mode. Um, so normally we're not trying to make a buck off of the opportunities that we've been afforded by the park service. Um, we're very grateful and somewhat humble at, at the opportunities that we've been given and just very grateful that we've had these opportunities and hope that this provides a little bit of motivation for for you or somebody else to go out there and and do the same so have an adventure be safe be um, aware of your environment and make sure you've asked permission thank you both brent and don wow what adventures you've had i'm kind of jealous that i haven't been able to get out there with you you've been so many incredible places um evidenced by your beautiful imagery uh, we'll wrap things up for the day everyone if you do have questions please submit them in the q a or chat uh, we might have time for one to verbalize but again i'll just echo everyone today um, get out and explore the night and capture images if you want to, but just capture those memories. Um, so I think one question I'll ask for our panel, if you'd like to just um, put forth your opinions is, since the NAR initiative supports gateway communities, if you are a gateway community or a community leader, how can you market yourself as an astrophotography destination? And what kind of work needs to happen for that to be um, how you're viewed by visitors? So anyone who wants to talk about that. I feel like Ryan might have some good thoughts on that one. 
Ryan did have to go pick up his kids, so he's uh -huh. on his phone. We'll see. <laughs> what we <can> do. <laughs> um, well, I can speak to my experience in Moab. Um, we have a local tourism council here, um, and they really they're part of the local dark sky group. So I think it's really important for communities who are marketing astrotourism and astrophotography as a draw uh, to walk the talk, right? And to not just use astrophotography as a way to bring people in and get more money for the community, but to actually support the initiatives that are going on to conserve and preserve that resource that will keep those people coming into the future. So we've had a really good experience here in Moab with our own tourism council being super supportive of dark skies. And there is a dark sky like page on the Moab tourism website. And I think just Utah tourism as well is really supportive of our dark sky conservation initiatives. And I think with sharing information about coming to visit for astrophotography, also sharing information about dark sky conservation practices and helping people be aware that it's a resource that is fragile, that needs protecting and having that additional voice as well can be really powerful in helping to support and bring about awareness and support for dark sky conservation. So it can be mutual, mutually beneficial, but it can also go really wrong. Um, and you can bring people in with tourism and not have any idea or thought about actually conserving that resource, which can then begin to destroy that resource. So it's a fine edge sword, but um, definitely can be done well. Yeah, that's, I, I tag on to that last comment. That's something we've actually talked a lot about with the Park Service when they say, hey, will you guys go out to this spot and take some photographs of that? And one of the things that we've always said is, okay, but let's let's talk about this. Where are you going to go with this? If, if we go out and take, if you will, pretty pictures of this spot and those pictures get out on social media or whatever, that could make other people want to go there. And that drives all sorts of other issues in terms of usage, possibly waste, possibly you know, graffiti. So that's always been part of what we've tried to be very conscious of is what are the ramifications of putting some of these photos out there in sensitive areas and making sure that it's a, a deliberate and, and thoughtful approach. Thank you. Those were wonderful responses. And I, I think the takeaway is just be smart, ask questions, do your homework, um, think about the vision for your community and what you need to do to get there and make sure you do it responsibly. Wonderful comments. Uh, I think we'll wrap things up. It's almost 3.30. Thanks to everyone who stayed with us an extra half hour. Um, I hope you found it valuable. I certainly did. Again, if you wanna reach out to our panelists, we'll make sure that information is shared. And then Liz has put more information about the Western Night Skies Council as well as the NAR initiative in the chat. Uh, so with that, we'll wrap things up. Thank you again, everyone for joining us. And again, happy International Dark Sky Week. We'll, we'll stick on for a minute, but yeah, thanks everyone. Happy Dark Sky Week. Yeah, discover the night. <laughs> <laughs>